welcome to our Secret Teachings of All Ages lecture for today, which is on fishes, insects, animals, reptiles, and birds, part two. Uh, it's the second chapter on the same subject. It's actually separated into two parts in the book. So we will be covering it today. Um, as always, I'll begin just with some little bit of music. And then we'll... Uh, We'll start. start on our main topic which is let me switch over my thing here and make sure that I um, um, that I am visible on the stream it w it's been flickering when I've been alt tabbed away from it so just want to make sure that when I'm in it I can't see my stream program when I'm on it this page itself okay looks fine Okay, so today, or yesterday, we were discussing um, all the various mythological meanings of, the, of various types of animals and how they were used as symbols throughout history. Uh, we discussed, for example, the Jonah and the whale. Um, we discussed the... Uh, the world serpent of Norse mythology and Tiamat of the Sumerians. Uh, we discussed the scarab of the Egyptians. Uh, we discussed um, the kind of chimeras or, or combination animals like the like the sphinx or the centaur and the, or the man bull and their mythological meanings. Today we're going to continue with that. As appropriate emblems of various human and divine attributes, birds were included in religious and philosophic symbolism, that of pagans and of Christians alike. Cruelty was signified by the buzzard, courage by the eagle, self-sacrifice by the pelican, and pride by the peacock. The ability of birds to leave the earth and fly aloft toward the source of light has resulted in their being associated with aspiration, purity, and beauty. Wings were therefore often added to various terrene creatures in an effort to suggest transcendency. Because their habitat was among the branches of the sacred trees in the hearts of ancient forests, birds were also regarded as the appointed messengers of the tree spirits and nature gods dwelling in these consecrated groves and through their clear notes the gods themselves were said to speak. Many myths have been fabricated to explain the brilliant plumage of birds. A familiar example is the story of Juno's peacock, in whose tail feathers were placed the eyes of Argus. Numerous American Indian legends also deal with, with birds and the origin of the various colors of feathers. The Navajos declared that when all living things climbed to the stalk of a bamboo to escape the flood, the wild turkey was on the lowest branch and his tail feathers trailed in the water, hence his color was washed out. There's many uh, stories about that as well, that the, uh, um, that the raven was white, but then when he was sent out by Noah to find if there was land, he came back and became black because he didn't 
Or he didn't come back and he became black because of his betrayal or something like that. And a dove went out and found land and came back and stayed white. Um, there's also, uh, I made the image of this picture, a uh, seagull, which has a special meaning to, uh, especially Utah Mormons. Um, and that is when, in the early days of the Mormon settlement of Utah, they... Uh, there was a, I believe it was a plague of locusts or, or some type of, I guess they're crickets, but locusts are crickets and they, um, uh, they, when they're swarming and they had all their crops eaten and they thought this is a disaster and also, it's, you know, obviously it's a biblical plague, so what have we done wrong? And uh, they prayed and a great flock of seagulls came and ate all the locusts and saved the Mormon people around the Great Salt Lake from uh, from having all their crops destroyed and starving. So that has been adopted as a uh, symbol of the Mormon faith, the seagull. Um, and uh, today, even like their their uh, some of their bookstores are called Seagull Books. Also, we discussed the honeybee in the last episode, and they they also have a Deseret Books. It's the church owned book branch uh, that they use. The Egyptian um, seems to be related to the Egyptian Deseret, which means honeybee, and uh, one of the unexplainable. Um, translations that Joseph Smith made in the Book of Mormon that was not known to people at the time. Uh, they were only just translating the Rosetta Stone at the time that he wrote the Book of Mormon or translated the Book of Mormon, depending on how, what your opinion of it is. Anyway, um, continuing on. Gravitation, which is a law in the material world, is the impulse toward the center of materiality. Levitation, which is a law in the spiritual world, is the impulse toward the center of spirituality. Seeming to be capable of neutralizing the effect of gravity, the bird was said to partake of a nature superior, superior to other terrestrial creation, and its feathers, because of their sustaining power, came to be accepted as symbols of divinity, courage, and accomplishment. A notable example is the dignity attached to eagle feathers by the American Indians, among whom they are insignia of merit. Angels have been invested with wings because, like birds, they were considered to be the intermediaries between the gods and men and to inhabit the air or middle kingdom betwixt the heaven and the earth. As the dome of the heavens was likened to a skull in the Gothic mysteries, so the birds which flew across the sky were regarded as thoughts of the deity. For this reason, Odin's two messenger ravens were called Hugin and Munin, thought and memory. Among the Greeks and Romans, the eagle was the appointed bird of Jupiter, and consequently signified the swiftly moving forces of the Demiurge. Uh, hence it was looked upon as the mundane lord of the birds, in contradistinction to the phoenix, which was symbolic of the celestial ruler. Uh, the eagle typified the sun in its material phase, and also the immutable demiurgic law beneath which all mortal creatures must bend. The eagle was also the hermetic symbol of sulfur, and signified the mysterious fire of Scorpio, the most profoundly significant sign of the zodiac, and the gate of the great mystery, as we discussed in the last video. Uh, being one of the three symbols of Scorpio, the eagle, like the goat of Mendes, was an emblem of the theurgic art and the secret processes by which the infernal fire of the scorpion was transmuted into the spiritual light fire of the gods. Uh, that's, that's, yes, the, the constellation Scorpio used to be regarded as an eagle, uh, as well as a serpent. There were basically two, two other very common Western astrological readings from the Chaldean Babylonian school that we inherit today um the it, it's uh, it's interesting because uh, the eagle as the image of the demiurge uh, it's a uh, obviously it's very common on 
in the symbolism of, of European monarchies and American democracy. Uh, the eagle is well known today as being a symbol of the United States and uh, in a certain sense it represents the demiurgic force in that sense and also represents the gateway to the mysteries. On the dollar bill it holds uh, arrows and also olive branches, the olive branches of peace and the arrows of war. Uh, the, the symbolism of the eagle is, is a pretty deep symbolism uh, and we could get into it pretty deeply going back to, for example, the Holy Roman Empire and the double-headed eagle of the Habsburg dynasty in particular. Uh, the double-headed eagle may have originally represented the split between Western and Eastern Roman Empire, uh, and the Aquila, the eagle, being the symbol of the Roman legion. Uh, it was on the standard of all the, of, of many of the Roman legions. Some of the other, uh, some legions uh, or, or other types of forces used other animals, I, I, I have understood uh, sometimes Ursa, a bear, or um, Equus, a horse. But they, most often it was the eagle, for, for especially for the Roman legionary, who was an infantry unit. Uh, when, when the empire split into the Eastern and Western Roman empires, the, the two-headed eagle symbolized that there were two, um, two emperors, two minds, but one body. Uh, some point to an even earlier root of the two co-consuls, uh, the consul and the co-consul in, Ro in the Roman Republic, which was the practice of having um, co-rulers uh, so that one could not rule with pure dictatorial power but required the, uh, the consent of the other. Um, that became a symbol of the Habsburg dynasty and especially it became uh, a important symbol when the Austrian Hungarian Empire uh, or the, uh, the Kingdom of Austria Hungary I, I've, I'm not sure of the exactly proper nomenclature of that they the Austrian Empire was was essentially split by treaty into uh, I think the Austrian Empire and the Kingdom of Hungary and together they were called the Austrian-Hungarian Empire and the Austro, the Kingdom of Austro-Hungary, something like that. Um, but in any case, it's been a common symbol within European um, imagery for a long time. And actually, Russia for a long time also used the eagle, and many other cultures um, in Poland, for example, uh, I believe used the white eagle. Um, there were many, many eagles in, in European um, vexillology, the uh, making of old European flags, especially in, the ti in feudal times. Um, among certain American Indian tribes, the Thunderbird is held in a peculiar esteem. This divine creature is said to live above, above the clouds. The flapping of its wings causes the rumbling which accompanies storms, while the flashes from its eyes are the lightning. Birds were used to signify the vital breath, and among the Egyptians, mysterious hawk-like birds with human heads and carrying, uh, and carrying in their claws the symbols of immortality are often shown hovering as emblems of the liberated soul over the mummified bodies of the dead. In Egypt, the hawk was the sacred symbol of the sun. And Ra, Osiris, and Horus are often depicted with the heads of hawks. I think that these things were translated from a PDF uh, by the probably copied because it's public domain. They probably copied it, and some of the words are incorrectly copied sometimes and replaced with something relatively similar. So here we see it re reads horns, but I believe it was Horus. Uh, the cock, or rooster, was a symbol of Kashmala, Cadmilus, uh, in the Samothracian mysteries, and is also a phallic symbol sacred to the sun. It was accepted by the Greeks as the emblem of Ares, Mars, and typified watchfulness and defense. 
Uh, when placed in the center of a weather vane, it signifies the sun in the midst of the four corners of creation. The Greeks sacrificed a rooster to the gods at the time of entering the Eleusinian mysteries. Uh, Sir Francis Bacon is supposed to have died as the result of stuffing a fowl with snow. May this not signify Bacon's initiation into the pagan mysteries, which still existed in his day? We discussed in the last video the fact that most often an initiation is symbolized by a death and rebirth uh, symbolically. And it is often said, and we'll get to a chapter later in this book about Sir Francis Bacon, which, um, which says that the, uh, the great esotericist may have faked his death and gone on to live a longer time in uh, Germany. Um, I'll also go back and mention, as I live on the island of Kauai, in the state of Hawaii, uh, the, uh, the, the island symbol is the rooster. And you may hear, if you listen throughout this lecture and any lectures that I do here in Hawaii, that uh, there's uh, roosters in the background because they are very common and just stroll around the neighborhood and just uh, walk right through the walk right through the yard or wake everyone up in the morning and uh, they're uh, they're the most common tourist complaint and a widely uh, loved local symbol of Kauai pride uh, they also are a symbol of for example the Kauai brewery uh, it also holds an alchemical staff of uh, of uh, Ninkasi, I believe, the Sumerian goddess of beer, or who gifted the art of fermentation to humankind. In any case, uh, the rooster is uh, also a symbol of the country of France, and, um, and the Gallic rooster has often been a symbol of uh, both French pride and French quickness to take offense or to go into battle. Um, I, depending on who is using the symbol, it is used either in a positive or negative sense. Um, uh, Brad from Earth, in our, I, I periodically would take a look at the YouTube com or uh, chat. Brad from Earth says, hope you're doing well, Lex. I am doing well, thank you. I, my life has greatly improved recently with the moving to, uh, to be with my family in Hawaii. So continuing on, um, both the peacock and the ibis were objects of veneration because they destroyed the poisonous reptiles which were popularly regarded as the emissaries of the infernal gods. Because of the myriad of eyes in its tail feathers, the peacock was accepted as the symbol of wisdom and on account of its general appearance, it was often confused with the fabled phoenix of the mysteries. There's a curious belief that the flesh of the peacock will not putrefy, even though kept for a considerable time. As an outgrowth of this belief, the peacock became the emblem of immortality, because the spiritual nature of man, like the flesh of this bird supposedly, is incorruptible. The Egyptians paid divine honors to the ibis, and it was a cardinal crime to kill one, even by accident. It was asserted that the ibis could live only in Egypt, and that if transported to a foreign country, it would die of grief. The Egyptians declared this bird to be the preserver of crops, and especially worthy of veneration because it drove out the winged serpents of Libya, uh, which the wind blew into Egypt. The ibis was sacred to Thoth, and... Um, when its head and neck were tucked under its wing, its body closely resembled the shape of a human heart. See Montfaucon's Antiquities. The black and white ibis was sacred to the moon, but all forms were revered because they destroyed crocodile eggs, the crocodile being a symbol of the, det of the detested typhon. Uh, before I go on, I just while I'm thinking of it, I want to bring up... Um, uh, Manly P. Hall up at the top here uh, brought up the buzzard uh, as being a symbol of cruelty um, 
And I was briefly reminded here that the Tibetans use, uh, they often perform what are called sky burials, which is also happens sometimes in Zoroastrian, or is common also in Zoroastrian, as well as the Bonpo religion of Tibet. Uh, so throughout Persia, uh, Afghanistan, Tibet, you might find the practice of, um, of sky burial, which is the practice of uh, putting out a body, often butchering a body, a human body, in order to be um, easily devoured by vultures or other birds of prey, or carrion birds, specifically carrion birds. Uh, the belief is that the carrion birds will carry the soul of the deceased into the heavens. Um, this is a uh, considered a very powerful and beautiful ceremony by many people, and actually, uh, uh, the I believe there's also a, some relation to the golden eagles of Kazakhstan, one of the world's largest birds and one of the largest raptors that can be trained in in the art of falconry or hunting uh bird hunting with birds with uh particularly raptors they uh they're a very large bird that was uh supposedly even used to hunt the asiatic lion and uh tigers perhaps um so uh, may have even hunted the Asiatic lion to extinction or near extinction. Uh, may also hunt other types of big game, um, relatively big game goats and uh, uh, and so on. Uh, I just wanted to put that in there while I was reminded. Ah, oh, it would have been good to do coming up, but. Uh, nocturnal birds were appropriate symbols of both sorcery and the secret divine sciences. Sorcery because black magic cannot function in the light of truth, which is day, and is powerful only when surrounded by ignorance, or symbol, symbolized by night. And the divine sciences because those possessing the arcana are able to see through the darkness of ignorance and materiality. Owls and bats were consequently often associated with either witchcraft or wisdom. Uh, I'll, I'll mention here that um, owls have often been associated with wisdom. Uh, they they can be a uh, a symbol of the uh, the Greek goddess Hera, and and have other significances. For example, being used at Bohemian Grove which people have linked to Molech worship, uh, which we discussed a little bit in the last video. The, um, uh, an interesting thing about owls is that in some cultures they're, they are considered to be wise, and in some cultures, particularly uh, North American natives, um, the American Indians believed many of them believed that the owl was a, a uh, ill omen and a sign of uh, impending doom or death. Um, I had a uh, I had an art teacher in high school who was who was uh, one of Nevada's uh, Native Americans and he uh, uh, someone brought in a stuffed owl and he was uh, and he was visibly upset by the fact that someone had brought an owl into the class room because of, of its symbolism in his tribe uh, as being uh, a symbol of, of death, impending death. Um, and obviously in, in many other cultures uh, it is not seen as a symbol of death and, and is seen as a, as a wise creature. The goose was an emblem of the first primitive substance or condition from which and within which the worlds were fashioned. In the mysteries, the universe was likened to an egg which the cosmic goose had laid in space. Because of its blackness, the crow was the symbol of chaos or the chaotic darkness preceding the light of creation. The grace and purity of the swan were emblematic of the spiritual grace and purity of the initiate. This bird also represented the mysteries which unfolded these qualities in humanity. 
This explains the allegories of the gods, the secret wisdom incarnating in the body of a swan, the initiate. And that also has relevance to the story of the ugly duckling, which is a swan raised among ducks and believes that it's an outcast, grows into a swan. This is also a symbolic story of someone who is uh, often people who are destined for a shamanic um, calling or some kind of initiatic calling that requires initiation into some mystery, um, whether it be a priesthood or uh, a sect of some kind or shamanism, so on. They often exhibit things which out uh, behaviors and, and interests which may mark them as being outliers of their communities. Um, uh, oftentimes in, in our culture, these are misunderstood as autism or schizophrenia, um, which can also just be problematic. But in, in Africa, for example, schizophrenia is usually considered to be uh, a sign of oncoming uh, sh shamanic growth or, or birth, rebirth into a shamanic calling. Um, so the... Uh, Duck, the Ugly Duckling is a, a story that, that uh, symbolizes that. Also, uh, going back to the goose, the goose that laid the golden egg is a very common um, a common symbol that's often found uh, mythologically, a goose laying quite large eggs that... Uh, actually, I've never had one, so I don't know if they're delicious or anything, but uh, I th as I understand it, they're larger, I believe, than chicken eggs. Um, and so they were considered to be, um, you know, somewhat productive. They were a productive fowl to have. And um, you could also use their feathers for various things. But a goose that laid golden eggs was especially useful. It may also be the opposite, that maybe a goose's eggs were not as valuable as a chicken's eggs. Uh, I'm not sure whether they were or they weren't. But I can imagine that it could work either way, and that the other way would be that the goose with a golden egg would then be contrasting it with a regular goose whose egg is relatively worthless. I, I don't know um, if anyone has ever had goose eggs or knows if they're any good to eat. Uh, maybe you'll, you can shed light on this uh, particular question. Uh, continuing on. Uh, being scavengers, the vulture, the buzzard, and the condor signified that form of divine power which by disposing of refuse and other matter dangerous to the life and health of humanity cleanses and purifies the lower spheres. These birds were therefore adopted as symbols of the disintricative process which accomplished good while apparently destroying, uh, like the god Shiva. Uh, they're often uh, kind of like Shiva. And... Uh, Sometimes you'll see that imagery related to uh, some types of sky burial, um, but it's relatively uncommon uh, for that kind of destructive bird. But the accomplishing good while destroying is a is an aspect of Shiva, uh, creating through destruction. And by some religions, uh, these birds have been mistakenly regarded as evil. Um, birds such as the parrot and raven were accorded veneration because being able to mimic the human voice they were looked upon as links between the human and animal kingdoms and in fact recently I was watching a video of parrots of parrots singing different songs and parrots are even, were even able to sing along with uh, their owner uh, playing piano uh, and things like things like that or playing guitar and they're, they're pretty amazing um, amazingly smart creatures. Uh, I think that we often underestimate the extent of animal intelligence, uh, and I often reflect on that with, um, here at my home, we have four cats and, and a dog, and, um, and they are all uniquely intelligent and very intelligent uh, in their own ways, um, particularly suited to their uh, historical environment and their biological needs but um, uh, going just mentioning quickly again the the vulture and the buzzard uh, carrion birds in 
in Central Asia in particular, uh, symbolizing um, the spirits that carry uh, people to heaven. They also have a, um, because of the sky burials, but they also have a symbolism in European paganism and particularly in Norse paganism. They have a tie with the uh, Norse Valkyrie, which was the angel who would descend to carry the spirit of the fallen warrior to Valhalla and uh, to especially to the hall of heroes who had fallen uh, in battle and the um, the vulture was a the bird that would descend on the physical bodies of of the uh, of the deceased and so there's a there was a uh, a link between carrion birds um, the crow the raven the vulture or buzzard um, and I'm not sh sure what varieties of vulture or buzzard or what other types of carrion birds might be native to Scandinavia but I, I, and I do know that they have been associated with uh, Valkyries in some imagery uh, as the angelic Valkyrie carries the uh, the heroic soul to Valhalla, the vulture uh, devours and carries the deceased body to the heavens. Um, the dove, ex uh, accepted by Christianity as the emblem of the Holy Ghost, is an extremely ancient and highly revered pagan yonic symbol. Uh, yoni means representing the vagina or the feminine aspect if people are not familiar with the term. It's uh, its um, counterpart for males is the phallic symbolism. So yoni and the phallus and the yoni are the are generally the two terms you'll hear phallic symbol or or the other in terms of the actual the actual pair to yoni because it's Sanskrit is linga or lingam and the lingam is a uh, often is a stone that is used to represent uh, Shiva or another god uh, represents the masculine creative principle but represents more broadly and it looks like a penis um, the yoni is is symbolic and is a is a basin that surrounds the the lingam uh, and it's when they pour water or milk on top of the lingam uh, it's signifying that the uh, the sacred seed is coming from the lingam and entering into the the yonic basin uh, so that's if people are unfamiliar with that uh, iconology that's that's the basics of lingic and yonic um, meanings uh, in many of the ancient mysteries the dove represented the third person of the creative triad or the fabricator of the world um, as the lower worlds were brought into existence through a generative process so the dove has been associated with those deities identified with the procreative functions it is sacred to a start uh, a start a uh, sibella isis venus juno my my lida my lida and aphrodite on account of its gentleness and devotion to its young, the dove was looked upon as the embodiment of the maternal instinct. The dove is also the emblem of wisdom, for it represents the power and order by which the lower worlds are maintained. It has long been accepted as a messenger of the divine will and signifies the activity of God. Uh, famously, it, uh, it, the dove was that which descended upon uh, Jesus after he was baptized by John the Baptist representing this the Holy Spirit descending upon Jesus and representing Jesus's transformation or, or uh, um, accomplishment you could say uh, becoming Jesus the Christ uh, his anointing the anointing with oil traditionally takes place after and, and is symbolic of the anointing of the, of the Spirit the spirit is anointed upon the 
the the uh, person who receives baptism and after they undergo the spiritual death and rebirth of baptism they are then anointed with the Holy Spirit um, which is often symbolized by oil and, and usually placed upon the forehead um, uh, this anointing can also be done for the sick and the dying at various times it depends on the priesthood traditions in Christianity but it is often done in those situations and represents mercy uh, and, the, and the Holy Spirit and its descent on Christ as he um, exited the River Jordan about from his baptism by John the um, the dove as I mentioned before was also seen as being a symbol of uh, of peace as it returned with an olive branch uh, when Noah sent it out to find land and it signified that it found land by returning with an olive branch uh, that meant it could have it must have found land or else it wouldn't have found an olive branch so uh, that symbol is seeing a is seen as being a symbol of peace and goodwill or a symbol that the troubles are over the the trial of the great flood was coming to an end and that way it is used by people who are trying to make peace coming out of war to say that our times of tribulation are finished uh, we're we're not going to fight anymore we're not going to uh, have this upheaval represented by the kind of apocalyptic scenario of the flood before I continue with this let's just take a look at this picture the Phoenix on its nest of flames from Lycos or Lycosthenes prodigiorum ac ostentorum chronicon the Phoenix is the most celebrated of all the symbolic creatures fabricated by the ancient mysteries for the purpose of concealing the great truths of esoteric philosophy Though modern scholars of natural history declared the existence of the phoenix to be purely mythical, Pliny describes the capture of one of these birds and its exhibition in the Roman Forum during the reign of the Emperor Claudius. And here we see the phoenix in the flames. Of course, the phoenix famously either bursts into flames or when it is burnt, as if to cook or to uh, cremate, it, it becomes reborn from its own ashes. Continuing on, the, the name of the dove has been given to oracles and to prophets. The true name of the dove was Yona or Jonas or Jonah, um, which was, as we discussed, associated with um, also the whale, Jonah the whale. Uh, it was a very sacred emblem and uh, at one time almost universally received. It was adopted by the Hebrews and the mystic dove was regarded as a symbol from the days of Noah by all who were of the Church of God. The prophet sent to Nineveh as God's messenger was called Yonah or Jonah or the dove. Our Lord's forerunner, the Baptist, was called in Greek by the name Ioannis. Uh, the John in Greek is Ioannis or uh, Johannes. And so was the Apostle of Love, the author of the fourth gospel of the Apocalypse, named Johannes. From, this is from Bryant's Analysis of Ancient Mythology. In Masonry, the dove is the symbol of purity and innocence. It is significant that in the pagan mysteries, the dove of Venus was crucified upon the four spokes of a great wheel, thus foreshadowing the mystery of the crucified Lord of Love. Uh, although Muhammad drove the doves from the temple at Mecca, occasionally he is depicted with a dove sitting upon his shoulder as the symbol of divine inspiration. In ancient times, the effigies of doves were placed upon the heads of scepters to signify that those bearing them were overshadowed by divine prerogative. In medieval art, the dove frequently was pictured as an emblem of divine benediction. I'll briefly just see if there's been any comments in the our friend Kido has said can Otto get a shout out um, shout outs to Otto the 
5D messenger, golden retriever of God. Uh, the Phoenix. Clement, one of the ante nicene fathers, um, preceding, preceding the Nicaean Creed, or the Nicene Creed, as it's often pronounced, um, describes in the first century after Christ the peculiar nature and habits of the Phoenix in this wise. There is a certain bird which is called a Phoenix. This is the only one of its kind and lives 500 years, and when the time of its dissolution draws near that it must die, it builds itself a nest of frankincense and myrrh and other spices, into which, when the time it is fulfilled, it enters and dies. But as the flesh decays, a certain kind of worm is produced, which, being nourished by the juices of the dead bird, brings forth feathers, and then, when it has acquired strength, it takes up that nest in which are the bones of its parent, and bearing these, it passes from the land of Arabia into Egypt, to the city called Heliopolis. And an open day, flying in the sight of all men, it places them on the altar of the sun, and having done this, hastens back to its former abode. The priests then expect the register of the dates, and find that it is returned exactly as the 500th year was completed. Although admitting that he had not seen the phoenix bird, there being only one alive at a time, Herodotus amplifies a bit the description given by Clement. They tell a story of what this bird does, which does not seem to me to be credible. And for Herodotus to say it doesn't seem credible is very incredible. <laughs> because the man thought a lot of things were, were credible that were pretty weird. Anyway, uh, they tell a story of this bird, which does not seem to me to be credible. That he comes all the way from Arabia and brings the parent bird, all plastered with myrrh, to the temple of the sun, and there buries the body. In order to bring him, they say, he first forms a ball of myrrh as big as he can find and he can carry. Then he hollows out the ball and puts his parent inside, after which he covers over the opening with fresh myrrh, and the ball is then exactly the same weight as at first. So he brings it to Egypt, plastered over as I have said, and deposits it in the temple of the sun. Such is the story they tell of the doings of this bird. Both Herodotus and Pliny noted the general resemblance in shape between the phoenix and the eagle, a point which the reader should carefully consider. For it is reasonably certain that the modern Masonic eagle was originally a phoenix. The body of the phoenix is described as having been covered with glossy purple feathers, which its long, while its long tail feathers were alternately blue and red. Its head was light in color, and about its neck was a circlet of golden plumage. At the back of its head, the phoenix had a peculiar tuft of feathers, a fact quite evident, although it has been overlooked by most writers and symbolists. The phoenix was regarded as sacred to the sun, and the length of its life, 500 to 1,000 years, was taken as a standard for measuring the motion of the heavenly bodies, and also the cycles of time used in the mysteries, to designate the periods of existence. Uh, it's, it's roughly one quarter of a great year, or a platonic year, which is 2,160 years. But I, I can't think of an astronomical measurement that 500 years closely aligns with. Um, I, maybe there is an outer planet that has an orbit that is, a, maybe Pluto is about 500 years in orbit, something like that. Um, I believe that our Pluto return for the Earth, uh, in fact, I, I'm going to take the time to look this up because, um, uh, because I think I'm interested to know what the, uh, uh, what the, now, Pluto's, Pluto's orbital period is about 250 years. It's 248 years. So, I'm not sure exactly what the 500-year cycle exactly aligns with. Like I said, it's roughly like the... Um, it's roughly like a quarter of the great year. Well, not the great year. That's a one... The great year being uh, 25,000 
600 or so years, uh, or 25,900 years. It's 12 times 2,160, um, whatever that is. So, uh, I don't know what if it closely aligns to something. It's probably symbolic of something, though. Um, the diet of the bird was unknown. Well, if it didn't really exist, I guess its diet would be unknown. Some writers declare that it subsisted upon the atmosphere. Others that it rate at that it ate at rare intervals, but never in the presence of man. Modern masons should realize the special masonic significance of the phoenix, for the bird is described as using sprigs of acacia in the manufacture of its nest. The phoenix, which is the mythological Persian rock, is also the name of a southern constellation, and therefore it has both an astronomical and an astrological significance. I thought that the that the Persian rock was almost like the North American thunderbird. But I'm not sure. I thought it was a bird that was supposed to be of extremely large size, such that it could cause uh, whirlwinds or, or tornadoes by the flapping of its wings and could blot out the sun if it passed overhead. Uh, but I, I, I don't know. In all probability, the phoenix was the swan of the Greeks, the eagle of the Romans, and the peacock of the Far East. To the ancient mystics, the phoenix was a most appropriate symbol of the immortality of the human soul, for just as the phoenix was reborn out of its own dead self, seven times seven, so again and again the spiritual nature of man rises triumphant from his dead physical body. Medieval hermetists regarded the phoenix as a symbol of the accomplishment of alchemical transmutation, a process equivalent to human regeneration. The name phoenix was also given to one of the secret alchemical formula. The familiar pelican of the Rose Croix degree of Freemasonry he's referring to, uh, though, yeah, I can't think... As far as I know, in Rosicrucianism, at least insofar as the ancient mystical order Rosicrucis is confirmed, is concerned, I, I'm not sure that there is a pelican involved in those um, in those degrees. Um, so, in the, the familiar pelican of the Rose Croy degree, feeding its young from its own breast, is in reality a phoenix, a fact which can be confirmed by the by an examination of the head of the bird. The ungainly lower part of the pelican's beak is entirely missing, the head of the phoenix being far more like that of an eagle than of a pelican. In the mysteries, it was customary to refer to initiates as phoenixes, or men who had been born again. For just as physical birth gives man consciousness in the physical world, so the neophyte, after nine degrees in the womb of the mysteries, was born into a consciousness of the spiritual world. This is the mystery of the initiation to which Christ referred when he said, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. The phoenix is a fitting symbol of the spiritual truth. And Jesus also said that, um, uh, that they baptize you with water, but I will baptize you by fire, or, or something of that sort. That's a paraphrase, and I apologize if I got it inaccurately, but the baptism of fire is something that Jesus specifically mentioned and is also connected to the uh, the uh, imbuing of the Holy Ghost, which is said to create a feeling that is like a burning in the breast, uh, uh, perhaps of passion or of fervor or of uh, zeal for, for faith. Briefly, just checking the uh, the YouTube chat. Um, European mysticism was not dead at the time the United States of America was founded. Not at all. The hand of the mysteries controlled in the establishment of the new government. For the signature of the mysteries may still be seen on the great seal of the United States of America. Careful analysis of the seal discloses a mass of occult and Masonic symbols, chief among them the so-called American Eagle, 
a bird which Benjamin Franklin declared unworthy to be chosen as the emblem of a great, powerful, and progressive people. Uh, Benjamin Franklin, of course, preferring the turkey, which we eat on Thanksgiving, but which I don't think of as being a very noble bird in particular. Uh, Benjamin Franklin seemed to disagree. Here again, only the student of symbolism can see through the subterfuge and realize that the American eagle upon the great seal is but a conventionalized phoenix, a fact plainly discernible from an examination of the original seal. In his sketch of the history of the seal of the United States, Gaillard Hunt unwittingly brings forth much material to substantiate the belief that the original seal carried the phoenix bird on its obverse surface and the Great Pyramid of Giza upon its reverse surface. In a colored sketch submitted as a design for the Great Seal by William Barton in 1782, an actual phoenix appears sitting upon a nest of flames. This itself demonstrates a tendency towards the use of this emblematic bird. And I think, in fact, uh, I will just do a quick image search here because I think that uh, uh, there is still um, there's still remnants of uh, of the bird being a phoenix because I know I've seen it um, well and at least uh, at least quickly I found one seal which is the seal of the city of Atlanta um, which has uh, So, okay, maybe I will put this up briefly. So this is the flag of the city of Atlanta. And this is, for example, a remnant that would say that, uh, I know that uh, the, everything flickers when I all tab out of there, but just bear with me for a second. Um, this flag here, this is the flag of Atlanta, Georgia. And uh, as you can see, it's a, it's a phoenix rising from flames. There, as he's referencing there, there, there was, there's an old version of, uh, like of the uh, United States seal, which, which actually does use a phoenix or has a fire, at least, underneath the eagle. Um, but... I couldn't find it on a cursory search. Maybe you'll have better luck if you search for it. Especially if you look, I guess, a uh, colored sketch submitted as a design for the Great Seal by William Barton, 1782. You should be able to find that. Uh, let's take a look at some pictures here. The Phoenix or Eagle, which on the left is the bird's head from the first Great Seal of the United States, 1782 and on the right, the Great Seal of 1902. When the first Great Seal was actually cut, the bird represented upon it was very different from the eagle, which now appears. The neck was much longer, and the tuft of feathers at the upper back part of the head was quite noticeable. The beak bore little resemblance to that of, an e of the eagle, and the entire bird was much thinner and its wings shorter. It requires very little imagination to trace in this first so-called eagle, the uh, mythological phoenix of antiquity. What is more, there is every reason why a phoenix bird should be used to represent a new country rising out of the old, uh, while, as Benjer Benjamin Franklin caustically noted, the eagle was not a bird of good moral character. This is the, this is the characteristic tuft. I don't know if you can see my cursor or not. Uh, this is the characteristic tuft on the left of the... Um, of the head of the phoenix that you often see uh, you often see it with a kind of um, uh, protrusion or, or tuft of feathers coming off of its head like that And now we'll take a look at the Egyptian phoenix. 
or un-Egyptian phoenix, from Wilkinson's Manners and Customs of the Ancient Egyptians. The Egyptians occasionally represented the phoenix as having the body of a man and the wings of a bird. The biform uh, creature had a tuft of feathers upon its head, and its arms were upraised in an attitude of prayer. As the phoenix was the symbol of regeneration, the tuft of feathers on the back of its head might well symbolize the activity of the pineal gland, or third eye, the occult function of which was apparently well understood by the ancient priestcraft. And this kind of, as we've talked about, this kind of com combining of, uh, of, of animal characteristics with human characteristics is very um, normal in mythologies seen all over the world. Oftentimes wings uh, can be symbolic of something that flies. Uh, it doesn't necessarily have to actually have wings. It could just be something that flies or levitates. Uh, like, for example, the solar disk is a winged disk. That's because it flies through the sky. And so it was depicted with wings. There's other reasons as well. But, um, but many times uh, when something has wings, it is, a, it is showing that uh, it is a, um, a symbol related to uh, uh, the sky or flight. And as I brought up in the last episode, I brought up this picture of um of uh let's see i don't know maybe i oh no i do i do have it easy to get to okay i brought up this picture of um of jesus in the vesica pisces and this this figure um this particular uh image is uh shows around on the four corners uh, winged animals which uh you might recognize from the book of ezekiel as being the four faces of the um uh the the four faces of the angel which ezekiel sees in ezekiel one uh, it has the face of a man of an eagle of a bull and of a of a bear um and or of a lion. Uh, this is actually a lion. I don't know why I said bear. It's a, it's a lion. And these are also called the four gospel writers. Um, they each represent uh, uh, an aspect of the gospel. And their wings show that they're a heavenly thing. And that's what I was talking about last time, just to show that they are actually the um, uh, they're symbols of astrological ages. And so currently we're in the age of Pisces, which is symbolized by Jesus and the Vesica Pisces, which is the womb of the fish. And the secret age of our time is uh, Virgo or the Virgin. And that's also symbolized by the womb here. The, this shape is called the womb of the fish. Then if we move over here on the right, and he, remember Hebrew is read right to left, so that has a spiritual reason, is that when you write, you're writing towards the heart. Um, so spiritually secret things were written right to left, and it's often even employed, for example, Leonardo da Vinci writing right to left may have been a mystery school um, choice to make. And so... Uh, when we look here, we see that the um, the bull Taurus. This is our the preceding age to Pisces was um, it was actually um, it was actually Aries and uh, Libra, but the which was the age of Moses. That was the age that Jesus overturned by um, by perfecting the law of Moses um, by ending the sacrifice of rams and by overturning the temples uh, the money changers in the temple but at the beginning um, the first age and this is actually the, the reason why it's on here is it, it it's the cross of the zodiac these these two are actually they form a cross the eagle is as we mentioned Scorpio 
Uh, Scorpio used to be represented as an eagle oftentimes or as a serpent. Um, the eagle is the secret sign opposite of Taurus, the bull, and on the other side is Leo, the lion, which is the secret sign opposite of our coming age, which is the Aquarian age, symbolized by a person, a man who carries water. These are, we know that these are symbols of the constellations. We can confirm it by the fact that they are winged. Uh, because this says that they are something that's heavenly found in the sky. Uh, this is common symbolism in, in ancient mythologies. Ancient uh, symbolism of various kinds. I accidentally deleted the window that I was trying to go back to. I'm very good at this. There we go. Okay. Um, okay, so here we have the obverse and reverse of the Great Seal of the United States of America. This is from Hunt's History of the Seal of the United States. Uh, the significance of the mystical number 13, uh, which frequently appears upon the Great Seal of the United States, is not limited to the number of the original colonies. The sacred emblem of the ancient initiates, here composed of 13 stars, also appears above the head of the eagle. Uh, I, I should also say that in actual fact there are 13 zodiac signs but to make the mathematics of the zodiac easier uh, we decided to divide the sky into 12 equal sections of 30 degrees in order to make a 360 degree circle because 13 is not evenly divisible by or 360 is not evenly divisible by 13 um, the the sign that we omit is maybe one of the reasons why Scorpio is called the serpent because it's right next to Scorpio and it is called Ophiuchus and is the serpent bearer, uh, the one who bears the serpent. Or it can be seen as the secret sign, the bearer of the mysteries, the one who bears the serpent. And for that reason, that the sign Ophiuchus is a secret sign and is uh, not part of the public astrology, but is part of a private uh, or secret astrology that teaches that the number 13 um, is actually the, the, the true number of things. Uh, it's an interesting idea. For example, there are 12 apostles and there's Jesus. Uh, so Jesus himself would be Ophiuchus, the uh, the serpent bearer. As we discussed in the last, uh, Moses raised a brazen serpent on a cross in the desert. Uh, and supposedly, this is a this is a, a pre symbolizing of um, the crucifixion of Christ. Uh, Christ being the serpent um, is is actually a more common thing than you would guess, because. Uh, the serpent is what tempted Adam and Eve to enter into um, knowledge of themselves. And sometimes people even will say that Christ and Lucifer are the same person uh, in the sense that it is that which tempts you, which is that which teaches you. And the great teacher is that, um, is that being which eventually leads you to freedom. Uh, but you have to have a, pe a period of tutelage or a kind of submission to the teacher beforehand, which can be quite uh, insufferable. Uh, it's, it's a very interesting symbology, but which will be vehemently argued against by by many Christians that I know who, who will say that all of this stuff that we're talking about now is tainted by Luciferian doctrine. Um, that's a claim I don't really agree with, but um, there's, there's some reason to think that. Uh, I, I just don't happen to agree that what we're talking about now is Luciferian. Um, Though you could say that, that Luciferianism can best be defined as the belief that Jesus, the great light, is the light bringer. Uh, in, the, in John 1, 
it says, um, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And later it says, uh, uh, well, it says, in the Word was life, and the life was the light of men. I believe that's what it says. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. I, it's only a slight misquotation if it's incorrect. Um, so, okay, going back to the American Great Seal and the number 13, uh, here we see the 13 stars of the 13 colonies, but also the motto, E Pluribus Unum, contains 13 letters. From many, one. And you could think of that also as being symbolic of 12 and 1, like Jesus and the 12 apostles, um, adding up to 13. From many, there is one. All of them are one in the body of Christ. That's something that is written in uh, 1 Corinthians. I believe it's 1 Corinthians around 1227. Somewhere in that region. I want to say it's around there. Um, okay, so I think it's in 1 Corinthians 12 at least. So, and also the inscription, Anuit Coeptus, the... Uh, uh, I think it means a, a new order or a new corptus or it means uh, or septus means like a I guess like a chamber but uh, it's like a that's an order of uh, the ages I guess I guess well I'm thinking novus ordo seclorum I know it coeptus I don't know to keep seep this. Um, maybe someone in the chat remembers off the top of their head what that um, what the literal translation of Anuit Septus is. Keto brings up, I think Lucifer and Jesus are brothers like Sephirim, Seraphim and Heron. Uh, and also, as I brought up last time, as Enki and Enlil, and as um, that is how they're seen in the Mormon faith uh, in an LDS scripture and revelation um, which is basically a modern version of the Sumerian mystery school so the eagle clutches on the on the great seal of the United States the eagle clutches in its right talon a branch bearing 13 leaves and 13 berries uh, supposedly an olive branch uh, and in its left a sheaf of 13 arrows um, the face of the pyramid exclusive of the panel containing the date consists of 72 72 stones 72 being a reference to the great name of god which has 72 letters um, and it is arranged in 13 rows i highly encourage you especially if you're american you need to study this uh, Um, okay, so, um, okay, annu Annuit Septus or Annuit Coeptus is, I've heard people pronounce it both ways, um, it's from the Latin annuo and coeptum or septum, uh, commencement, undertaking, annuo meaning to approve, so it means favors our undertakings or God has favored us. God has favored our undertakings. If anyone doubts the presence of Masonic and occult influences at the time the Great Seal was designed, he should give due consideration to the comments of Professor Charles Eliot Norton of Harvard. Um, who wrote concerning the unfinished pyramid and the all-seeing eye which adorned the reverse of the seal as follows the device adopted by Congress is practically incapable of effective treatment uh, it can hardly however artistically treated by the designer look otherwise than as a dull emblem of a Masonic fraternity the history of the seal of the United States the eagles of Napoleon and Caesar uh, and the zodiac 
zodiacal eagle of Scorpio, a really phoenixes. For the latter bird, not the eagle, um, is the symbol of spiritual victory and achievement. Masonry will be in a position to solve many of the secrets of its esoteric doctrine when it realizes that both its single and double-headed eagles are phoenixes, and that to all initiates and philosophers the phoenix is the symbol of the transmutation and regeneration of the creative energy, commonly called the accomplishment of the great work. The double-headed phoenix is the prototype of an androgynous man, or someone who has been able to combine the ma masculine and feminine principles within one being. For according to the secret teachings, there will come a time when the human body will have two spinal cords, by means of which vibratory equilibrium will be maintained in the body. This is also a saying which has to do with the pillars Yaquin and Boaz, uh, which are, and the, uh, their subsequent harmonization through the middle pillar, which is the spine. These are the three pillars of the great tree of life, the middle pillar being the priest or the person himself. Uh, looking at the pillars or standing between them. Not only were many of the founders of the United States government Masons, but they received aid from a secret and august body existing in Europe, which helped them to establish this country for a, per for a peculiar and particular purpose known only to the initiated few. The Great Seal is the signature of this exalted body, unseen and for the most part unknown, and the unfinished pyramid upon its reverse side is a trestle board setting forth symbolically the task to the accomplishment of which the United States government was dedicated from the day of its inception. Before we move on, uh, returning to the chat, uh, Kido brings up, uh, yes, Enki and Enlo, where he was referencing, and he just got a thought that the gladiator is sort of the same story the, that's the uh, movie with Russell Crowe uh, where a fictionalized version of the Roman Emperor Commodius is looking over the um, uh, the uh, the gladiatorial arena and I think that his uh, his brother is is secretly kept away to keep from being murdered or something like that and ends up being a slave and then a gladiator and um, uh, eventually killing the emperor, his brother, I believe. So the uh, it it may be a parallel in that story. Uh, the two brothers stories are very common. Uh, I mean, even just Cain and Abel. Um, you could think of Cain as being Lu uh, Lucifer and Abel being Jesus. Uh, you could also think of. Um, uh, Uh, Jacob and, and his brother, whose who's, um, name is escaping me right now. It begins with an E. Uh, it means red in Hebrew. He's red-haired. Um, and Europeans are said to descend from, from him. Uh, I don't know why I can't remember his name. Anyway, uh, also the brothers... Um, uh, Romulus and Remus in, uh, in Roman mythology. There's many, many famous brother pairs that, that kind of have a, uh, a good-bad dichotomy going on. There's a good brother and an evil brother. Well, sometimes people talk about evil twins and doppelgangers and things of that nature. Uh, anyway, continuing on... Um, the lion is the king of the animal family, like the head of each kingdom, and is sacred to the sun, whose rays are symbolized by the lion's shaggy mane. The allegories perpetuated by the mysteries, such as the one to the effect that the lion opens the secret book, uh, signify that the solar power opens the seed pods, releasing the spiritual life within. There was also a curious belief among the ancients that the lion sleeps with his eyes open, and for this reason the animal was chosen as a symbol of vigilance. The figure of a lion placed on either side of doors and gateways is an emblem of divine guardianship. King Solomon was often symbolized as a lion. For ages this feline family has been regarded with peculiar veneration. 
In several of the mysteries, most notably the Egyptian, the priests wore the skins of lions, tigers, panthers, pumas, or leopards. Hercules and Samson, both solar symbols, slew the lion of the constellation of Leo and robed themselves in his skin, thus signifying that they represented the sun itself when it had reached the summit of the celestial arch. Uh, at Bubastis in Egypt was the temple of the famous goddess Bast, the cat deity of the Ptolemies. The Egyptians paid homage to the cat, um, especially when its fur was of three shades or its eyes of different colors. To the priests, the cat was symbolic of the magnetic forces of nature, and they surrounded themselves with these animals for the sake of the astral fire which emanated from their bodies. The cat was also a symbol of eternity, and for when it sleeps, it curls up into a ball with its head and tail touching. Among the Greeks and Latins, the cat was sacred to the goddess Diana. The Buddhists of India invested the cat with special significance, but for a different reason. The cat was the only animal absent at the death of the great Buddha because it had stopped on the way to chase a mouse. That the symbol of the lower astral forces should not be present at the liberation of the Buddha is significant. I also think uh, it's interesting that my my aunt is named Diane, and uh, we have three cats here, or she has three cats here. And she loves cats. We all love cats. Uh, I have my cat Aya, and then uh, my mother and my aunt have three cats together. Um, Regarding the cat, Herodotus says, whenever a fire breaks out, cats are agitated with a kind of divine motion, uh, which they that keep them observe, neglecting the fire. The cats, however, in spite of their care, break for them, leaping even over the heads of their keepers to throw themselves into the fire. Uh, the Egyptians then make great mourning for their death. If a cat dies a natural death in a house, all, all they of that house shave their eyebrows. If a dog, they shave the head and all the body. They used to embalm their dead cats and carry them to Bubastis to be interred in a sacred house, according to Montfaucon's uh, Antiquities. Uh, bringing up again Otto. Uh, Otto is a, uh, is a figure on our server he, he, represented by a um, golden retriever dog. And uh, there's often the dichotomy of, of dogs and cats, or auto and cot, as we say on the, uh, on the server. Uh, it's a little bit of a meme or inside joke around there, but we, it's, uh, it has a meaningful symbolism that is kind of funny. And to, to make peace between the warring factions of auto and cot, I made a channel called Islam because uh, the lamb is the symbol of peace. Uh, <laughs> so we named them um, for the time they were Protestants and they were Catholics. And then we had Islam <laughs> to decide between them. Okay. Um, uh, the most important of all symbolic animals was the apis, or Egyptian bull of Memphis, which was regarded as the sacred vehicle for the transmigration of the soul of the god Osiris. It was declared that apis was conceived by a bolt of lightning, and that this ceremony attendant uh, upon its selection and consecration was one of the most impressive of Egyptian ritualism. Uh, the apis had to be marked in a certain manner. Herodotus states that the bull must be black with a square white spot on its forehead, the form of an eagle, probably a vulture, on his back, a beetle upon or under his tongue, and the hair of his tail lying in two ways. Other writers declare that the sacred bull was marked with 29 sacred symbols. His body was spotted, and upon his right side was a white mark in the form of a crescent. After its sanctification, the apis was kept in a stable adjacent 
to the temple and led in processionals through the street of the city upon certain solemn occasions. It was a popular belief among the Egyptians that a child upon whom the bull breathed would become illustrious. After reaching a certain age of 25 years, the apis was taken either to the river Nile or to a sacred fountain. Authorities differ on this point and drowned amidst the lamentations of the populace. The mourning and wailing for his death continued until the new apis was found when it was declared that Osiris had reincarnated, whereupon rejoicing took the place of grief. And I know that this um, was something that changed over time in Egypt and, and it was also practiced in other places. But as it changed over time in Egypt, they also partook of every four year sacrifices of bulls. Uh, sacrifices of bulls were also performed in the Hebrew temple somewhat, uh, but they more often would sacrifice calves uh, or um, lambs. Uh, it's it sometimes the, a bull could be sacrificed for burnt offerings outside the tabernacle, uh, so they wouldn't be sacrificed at the shrine itself. Uh, but the bull is the symbol, the out, outward symbol of the Taurian age, the age of Taurus, and the astrological age preceding the age of Moses was the astrological age of Taurus. Uh, Tar Moses overthrew that by um, instituting the sacrifice of rams in place of the sacrifice of bulls, as the Egyptians had done, and also by uh, melting down the golden bull, which the Israelites made upon um, upon fleeing into the wilderness. Um, he famously uh, ground it, I think he ground it down into ashes and he made them drink it. Pretty metal. Literally, I guess. Um, and then, uh, so the the bull is symbolic of the Tarian age. Uh, it's also important in the uh, cult of Mithras, which I feel like he must mention here. I know that this continues for a while about the bull, so I'll continue on. The worship of the bull was not confined to Egypt, but was prevalent in many nations of the ancient world. In India, Nandi, the sacred white bull of Shiva, is still the object of much veneration. And both the Persians and the Jews accepted the bull as an important religious symbol. The Assyrians, Phoenicians, Chaldeans, and even the Greeks reverenced this animal, and Jupiter turned himself into a white bull to abduct Europa. The bull was a powerful phallic emblem, signifying the paternal creative power of the demiurges. At his death, he was frequently mummified and buried with the pomp and dignity of a god in a specially prepared sarcophagus. Excavations in the Serapium at uh, Memphis have uncovered the tombs of more than 60 of these sacred animals. They were also held to be sacred because the, the flocks of cattle were so important to the uh, the people, the early agrarians who were practicing animal husbandry, that the that the um, the impregnation of female cattle was, was was so important that the bull was was much too important to kill for food, and that's why a bull could sometimes be sacrificed because a bull was ex extremely valuable because a bull could impregnate many many cows, um, whereas a cow could only have one baby at a time and it was a, it's a difficult process for a cow so they can only have so many children um, so many calves so the sacrifice of the valuable bull was seen as being particularly significant so at the sign rising over the horizon of the vernal equinox um, constitutes the starry body for the annual incarnation of the sun. The bull not only was the celestial symbol of the solar man, this is talking about the zodiac age of Taurus, uh, but because the vernal equinox took place in the constellation of Taurus at that, the breaker or opener of the year. And <clears throat> uh, for this reason, in astronomical symbolism, the bull is often shown breaking the annular egg with his horns. 
The apis further signifies that the god mind is incarnated in the body of a beast, and therefore that the physical beast form is the sacred vehicle of the divinity. Um, man's lower personality is the apis in which o Osiris incarnates. Uh, the result of the combination is the creation of Sor Apis or Serapis, the material soul as ruler of the irrational material body and involved therein. After a certain period, which is determined by the square of five or twenty-five years, uh, the body, uh, by the square of five or twenty-five years, the body of the apis um, is destroyed and the soul liberated by the water, which drowns the material life, water being a symbol of the spirit. This was indicative of the washing away of the material nature by the baptismal waters of divine light and truth. The drowning of the apis is the symbol of death. The resurrection of Osiris in the new bowl is the symbol of internal renovation. The white bowl was also symbolically sacred as the appointed emblem of the initiates, signifying the spiritualized material bodies of both man and nature. When the vernal equinox no longer occurred in the sign of, Aqu uh, sign of Taurus, which occurred uh, almost 4,000 years ago, or more than 4,000 years ago, it could be, uh, it depends on how you draw the, the borders of the zodiac houses because they don't exactly align with the constellations. But anyway, uh, when the vernal equinox no longer occurred in the sign of Taurus, the sun god in, incarnated in the constellation of Aries and the ram became the vehicle of the solar power. Uh, going back briefly, it's very common to see a symbol in, uh, in Egypt of bull, uh, the horns of a bull surrounding the sun and um that was also reference to the the bowl uh when he talks about breaking open the sun of the year they also thought we talked about how the scarab was seen as pushing the sun across the sky backwards also the the sun could be seen as being carried between the horns of a bull across the sky that was various times uh, people have said that some people have said that the constellation of Gemini which preceded the age of Gemini preceded the age of Taurus uh, and would have been over 6,000 years ago may have been the age of uh, the scarab and that this may have been a previous sun sign uh, previous to our identification of Gemini as the twins is also possible it could have been something else and we just don't know uh, this is this is going too back, too far back in antiquity for us to have uh, good records, unfortunately. So, um, as we were saying, um, the Aries and the Ram became the symbol of the solar power, as the constellation of Aries became the ruling sign, which was between four thousand and. 2,000 years ago, 2,000-ish years ago. Um, the, beginning of the, be the beginning of the age of Pisces is debatable, but uh, it could... Ha the easiest time to peg it as is 0 AD, which would mean that we're going to switch over to Aquarius in 2160 AD. Um, fully switch over. We're in the transition period now. Um, what's called the cusp. But the... Um, we're definitely still within the constellation of of Pisces as far as where the sun rises on the vernal equinox. But when uh, when we look back at when the const when the age of Pisces started, Aries is a per is a small sign. Pisces is larger than 30 degrees, about 36 degrees if I recall, and, and Aries is smaller, and I believe it's about 23 degrees. And so the two signs, um, their zodiac houses, all zodiac houses are reckoned astrologically as being equal segments of 30 degrees, but the constellations themselves are not equally seg are not equal in the sky as being actually 30 degrees in size the stars of the constellation um, it's just that the house or section of the sky that most closely fits a particular constellation 
that particular constellation is used to name that house of the sky. Um, so it's not actually the the constellations themselves. Um, it's that the sky the sky itself is separated into segments, and the constellations are the easiest um, delineating marker or uh, to tell them apart. Now that's an important distinction, especially because it has bearing on how to read the tropical versus the sidereal zodiac. Uh, that's a topic for another time, uh, which we've discussed some previously. But going on, uh, the sun uh, rising in the sign of the celestial lamb triumphs over the symbolic serpent of darkness. The lamb is a familiar emblem of purity because of its gentleness and the whiteness of its wool. In many of the pagan mysteries, it signified the universal savior, and in Christianity, it is the favorite symbol of Christ. Early church paintings show a lamb standing upon a little hill, and from its feet pour four streams of living water, signifying the four gospels, and also signifying the four streams that, uh, that flowed out of paradise or Eden in the book of Genesis. The blood of the lamb is the solar life pouring into the world through the sign of Aries. Well, that's the blood of the, the sacrificed son, Jesus. And uh, that's the life of the son. The blood of the lamb pours into the world, fertilizing the earth, creating life. Um, and so the son is crucified on the cross, and that's the zodiac cross. Uh, the lamb is crucified on the zodiac cross. Uh, that is the ending of the age of Aries, was the crucifixion of the Lamb, which was Jesus. And so began the age of Pisces, because Jesus gave to his disciples the fish and the loaves um, in a miracle. And the fish, uh, the word ichthys in Greek, is an acronym for Jesu Christo Theo Eos Soter, uh, Jesus Christ, God's son, savior, and the uh, the fish was used as a symbol, both because it represented the vesica Pisces, a uh, geometric symbol which we discussed briefly earlier, uh, and also because it had connection to Enki and the, the fish god Dagon, um, which we also talked about in the last video. The... Um, the secret sign of the R age being Virgo, the Virgin. Uh, but the transition between the age of, between one age and another requires the overturning of one age. Um, and in fact, I personally wonder if we're seeing something in the fact that overfishing and, for example, Fukushima, the Fukushima disaster is causing the irradiation of fish in the Pacific and I live in Hawaii now, so the radiation of the Pacific is a, is a big deal to us. Um, whether that may be a sign of the ending of the age of Pisces, the, uh, the diminishing of the kingdom of fish, um, I don't know. But in any case, we'll, Jesus, when he was asked by his disciples, where shall we go to look for the Passover, he informs them, um, follow the man who carries water and enter into his house. The man who carries water is, of course, uh, Aquarius, who is the ruler of the next age. That We will see an overturning of the Piscean age at the end of this age, and then we will have an uh, institution of the um, Aquarian age. My personal feeling is that we're not quite there yet. So, uh, the goat is both a phallic symbol uh, and also an emblem of courage or aspiration because of its sure-footedness and ability to scale the loftiest peaks. To the alchemist, the goat's head was the symbol of sulfur. The practice among the ancient Jews of choosing a scapegoat upon which to heap the, mankind, the sins of mankind is merely an allegorical... Uh, depiction of the Son of Man, who is the scapegoat of the world, 
and upon whom are cast the sins of the twelve houses, tribes of the celestial universe. Truth is the divine lamb, worshipped through pagandom, and slain for the sins of the world. And since the dawn of time, the savior gods of all religions have been personifications of this truth. The golden fleece sought for by Jason and his Argonauts is the celestial lamb, the spiritual and intellectual sun. The secret doctrine is also typified by the golden fleece, the wool of the divine light, the rays of the sun of truth. Suidas uh, declares the golden fleece to have been uh, a reality, in reality a book written upon skin, which contained the formulae for the production of gold by the means of chemistry. And notably, there was a secret order, or actually it was a, a chivalric order, a knighthood order of the Golden Fleece, uh, which is, it actually may exist today either in the monarchy of Spain or of England, but at the time it was instituted by uh, the Duke of Burgundy. Um, and... I believe it, it may have survived in, um, in some form or other, but the Order of the Golden Fleece was founded as a Burgundian uh, chivalric order in the Middle Ages uh, and may very well have had secret alchemical um, meanings, as many things at that time did, uh, perhaps Rosicrucian in character, proto-Rosicrucian perhaps. Uh, could be arguable. Rosicrucianity may have existed for a very long time. So the uh, the mysteries were institutions erected for the transmutation of base ignorance into precious illumination. Uh, that's sim symbolized by the transmutation of base metals into gold, as lead into gold of the alchemist. The dragon of ignorance was the terrible creature set to guard the golden fleece and represents the darkness of the old year which battles with the sun at the time of its equinoctial passage. And then the sun has victory over it and the day becomes longer than the night for a period of time until the, the fall equinox when the night begins to have victory over the day. And then, and the winter solstice, the... Um, uh, the Savior is born back into the world because that is the time when the sun begins to increase again. And at the midsummer time, you could almost think that because it begins to darken, the midsummer time is actually a harbinger of evil in a lot of ways. And if you look at historical uh, celebrations, uh, pagan celebrations of midsummer, although they do, um, they are very joyful celebrations there were often uh, sacrifices, sometimes even human sacrifices, uh, and uh, at the midsummer blot, and they could uh, often take part in large uh, uh, or orgies of debauchery or bloodshed. Um, depending, you know, it depends on the time and place and people, of course, as anywhere. But Midsummer often has a latent kind of s uh, sinister character, whereas it's, it's, for example, you could think of in the yin-yang symbol, the yin and the yang, uh, the white yang has the black seed of yin inside of it at its utmost point. And the white seed of yin is, or the white seed of yang is in the utmost black of yin. Uh, that represents that in the greatest of something, it tends to flip to its opposite. That was a principle called by Heraclitus, the Greek uh, philosopher, uh, enantiodromia, running to the opposite. And uh, that characteristic is seen in the, uh, in the celebrations of midsummer and the winter solstice. The winter solstice being a celebration of hope and the summer solstice being in some ways a celebration of debauchery or uh, or it tends to be a, a more uh, uh, flamboyant and uh, uh, often sexual um, celebration. 
In fact, I've I've heard that in uh, in in the Baltic countries, uh, Latvia, Lithuania, and Estonia, uh, it's it's common f in certain kinds of uh, midsummer festivals for people to go into the uh, to go into the uh, woods naked and uh, and and find lovers there as part of the festivities. Or, as one can look into Shakespeare's A Midsummer Night's Dream, for an example of Midsummer having a strangely uh, ethereal but almost sinister character. Not necessarily sinister, but um, it signifies the extent of light and a, there is a shadow of oncoming darkness. As darkness will begin to increase whereas at winter solstice it's in darkness that the light reappears and begins to hope begins to increase and it finally wins its victory at the equinox so uh, continuing on deer were sacred in the Bacchic mysteries of the Greeks and the Bacantes were often clothed in fawn skins uh, deer was associated with the worship of the moon goddess, and the Bacchic orgies were usually conducted at night. The grace and speed of this animal caused it to be accepted as the proper symbol of aesthetic abandon. Deer were, off, were objects of veneration with many nations, and in Japan, herds of them are still maintained in connection with the temples. And they were very important to American Indians as well. And also, uh, uh, we could say that... Um, the, the, I guess, it, sometimes the legs of a satyr are uh, are depicted as being of a goat, and sometimes they couldn't be of a deer, and the deer and the goat are sometimes seen as being uh, lustful creatures. The wolf is associated with the principle of evil because of the mournful discordance of its howl and the viciousness of its nature. It has uh, many others, of course. Uh, it's a symbol of uh, also uh, independence and freedom and uh, self-reliance, things like that. And uh, the Native Americans, many Native Americans have a great respect for the wolf, despite it being... Uh, an often difficult animal to live beside. In Scandinavian mythology, the Fenris wolf was one of the sons of Loki, the infernal god of the fires. And in fact, I believe the legend is that Loki transformed himself into a female wolf and was impregnated with Fenris. Or the story is that Slepnir, the this horse of Odin was Enki's child, or not, not I mean Loki's child, through um, when he transformed himself into a female horse. Uh, there's some very interesting gender bending stuff that happens in Norse mythology sometimes, particularly with regard to its sorcery. Uh, that's a topic for another time, but. I, it's something to look into. It's quite odd, uh, it, but not too odd, I guess, in, in worldwide shamanism. With the Temple of Asgard in flames about them, the gods under the command of Odin fought their la last great battle against the chaotic forces of evil. With frothing jowls, the Fenris wolf devoured Odin, the father of the gods, and thus destroyed the Odinic universe. Here the Fenris wolf represents those mindless powers of nature that overthrew the primitive creation. The unicorn or monoceros uh, was a most curious creation of the ancient initiates. It is described by Thomas Borman as a beast which though doubted of by many writers yet is one yet is by others thus described he has but one horn, and that an exceedingly rich one, growing out of the middle of his forehead. His head resembles a, a heart's, or a deer's, and his feet an elephant's, his tail a boar's, and the rest of his body a horse's. 
The horn is about a foot and a half in length. His voice is like the lowing of an ox. His mane and hair are of a yellowish color. His horn is as hard as iron and as rough as any file, twisted or curled, like a flaming sword, very sharp, or straight, sharp, and everywhere black except the point. Great virtues are attributed to it, an expelling of poison and curing of several diseases. He is not a beast of prey. See Redgrove's Bygone Beliefs. This is probably um, a rhinoceros. Uh, it, it is often uh, thought to have been a um, a reference to the rhinoceros by many people who received report of it but had not seen one. Famously, the the unicorn is the symbol of is the I believe that the national an or the yeah the national animal of Scotland and um, and is also mentioned once in the King James translation of the Bible uh, though in in Hebrew it's it has no relation to a unicorn uh, in the King James version they chose to use the word unicorn to translate um, when the unicorn is mentioned several times in scripture, uh, like, like, like I was just mentioning, I think, I'm not sure if it was mentioned several times or just once, but it was mentioned in the King James Version. Uh, no proof has yet been discovered of its existence. There are a number of drinking horns in various museums, presumably fashioned from its spike. It is reasonably certain, however, that these drinking vessels were really made either from the tusks of some large mammal or the horn of a rhinoceros. J.P. Lundy believes that the horn of the unicorn symbolizes the hem of salvation mentioned by St. Luke, pricking the hearts of men, turning them, into, or turning them to a consideration of salvation through Christ. Medieval Christian mystics employed the unicorns as the emblem of Christ, and this creature must therefore signify the spiritual life in man. The single horn of the unicorn may represent the pineal gland or third eye, which is the spiritual cognition center in the brain. The unicorn was adopted by the mysteries as a symbol of the illumined spiritual nature of the initiate, the horn with which it defends itself being the flaming sword of the spiritual doctrine against uh, which nothing pro can prevail. In the book of Lambspring, a rare hermetic text, uh, one that I've never been able to find personally, uh, appears an engraving showing a deer and a unicorn scan standing together in a wood. The picture is accompanied by the following text. The sages say truly the two animals are in this forest. One glorious, beautiful, and swift, a great and strong deer, the other a unicorn. If we apply the parable of our art, we shall call the forest the body. The unicorn will be the spirit at all times. The deer desires no other name but that of the soul. He that knows how to tame and master them by art, to couple them together, and to lead them in and out of the form, may justly be called a master. Uh, so sometimes, sometimes there's often a division between soul and spirit, which we've discussed somewhat on the Discord. Uh, in Hebrew, they're very distinct, uh, but in Greek, the soul is best translated in Greek as psyche, which we would almost think of as being like the mind or the mental uh, traits, the mental capacities, uh, the uh, mental makeup of a person, rather than the substance of the mind, which is the nous, as we discovered in the last or we discussed in the last uh, episode. The, um, the spirit, on the other hand, is the pneuma, which is uh, in Hebrew, ruach, or the breath, or wind. Uh, the spirit is something intangible, whereas the psyche is something relatively tangible. Um, the, the soul is seen as being a vessel that the spirit inhabits. Uh, and together they the spirit is like a breath which has no shape of its own but which enlivens the thing that it is put into and so 
the psyche or soul that it is put into becomes a living soul with certain characteristics based upon the living spirit that enters into it. And that, when it enters into a body, a physical body, then uh, an ensouled and inspirited body is how something becomes an animate creature. Um, and that's not to say that inanimate things don't have a soul or spirit. They just don't have one that animates them. Uh, it may just be of a separate nature. And that's something that would be, it's worthy of discussion and deep thought, I think. Uh, often I think that in, in truth, there must be a soul and spirit to all things, a spiritual existence to anything that exists. But it having been created by a word of God, which represents uh, breath, the spirit being in, uh, exhaled into its shape, the word being the shape, the breath being the spirit that forms the shape. So the soul is like the shape of the word, and that informs its character. Uh, if we say that something is a unicorn, we have an instant image of what a unicorn represents. But in order to create the sound unicorn to communicate it, we must use the breath. And the breath is what gives spirit to the soul nature of unicorn, which creates the image in the mind. Um, and that is uh, our distinction of, of soul and spirit. So... Uh, he that knows how to tame the body, mind, and soul, or the body, mind, and spirit, or the body, soul, and spirit, uh, by art, and to couple them together, and to lean them in and out of the body, may justly be called a master. The Egyptian devil Typhon was often symbolized by the Set monster whose identity is obscure. It has a queer snout-like nose and pointed ears and may have been a conventional hyena. Set often is, is associated today by Egyptologists with hyenas. I have often, I've seen that uh, in, several, in several books. Um, the Set monster lived in the sandstorms and wandered about the world promulgating evil. By the way, it's, it's uh, raining off and on here if you... Uh, are hearing a sound that's what that is um, the Egyptians related the howling of the desert winds with the moaning cries of the hyena thus when in the depths of the night the hyena sent forth its doleful wail it sounded like the despairing cry of a lost soul in the clutches of Typhon among the duties of this evil creature was that of pro protecting the Egyptian dead against grave robbers Among other uh, symbols of Typhon was the hippopotamus, sacred to the god Mars because Mars was enthroned in the sign of Scorpio, the house of Typhon. The ass, was, or donkey, was also sacred to this Egyptian demon. Jesus riding into Jerusalem upon the back of an ass has the same significance as Hermes standing upon the prostrate form of Typhon. He had dominated the uh, lower beast. The early Christians were accused of worshipping the head of an ass. Uh, and actually, I believe something similar had been said about the Knights Templar. Uh, there's other head worship stories about the Knights Templar, but one of them was that they worshipped the head of a donkey, and they would kiss it and spit on the Bible and things like that, or spit on the cross. Um, a most curious animal symbol is the hog or sow, sacred to Diana and frequently employed in the mysteries as an emblem of the occult art. The wild boar, which gored Atis, shows the, the use of this animal in the mysteries. According to the mysteries, the monkey represents the condition of man before the rational soul enters into his constitution. Therefore, it typifies the irrational man. By some, the monkey is looked upon um, as a species not ensouled by the by the spiritual hierarchies, by others as a fallen state wherein man has been deprived of his divine nature through degeneracy. The ancients through evolutionists did not trace man's ascent through the monkey, 
the monkey they considered as having separated itself from the main stem of progress. The monkey was occasionally employed as a symbol of learning. Sinocephalus, the dog-headed ape, was the uh, Egyptian hieroglyphic symbol of writing and was closely associated with Thoth. Sinocephalus is symbolic of the moon and Thoth is of the planet Mercury. Because of the ancient belief that the moon followed Mercury about the heavens, the dog ape was described as the faithful companion of Thoth. Uh, and also, the Sinocephalus is uh, relevant to, as I discussed a little in the last episode, the uh, Sinocephalus was a kind of composite creature that persisted into the Middle Ages uh, with a lot of... Um, um, drawings and uh, art by monks depicting these dog-headed men. Uh, not necessarily apes, but uh, often humans. Um, we're nearing the end here, so if you have particular questions, it would be a good time to put them into the chat now so that I can get to them at the end of the YouTube. I know that the, the stream lags behind um, for you versus when I'm saying it so I like it's important for me to give it some time or else we'll run out of space uh, or we'll have to wait around at the end the dog because of its faithfulness denotes the relationship which should exist between disciple and master or between the initiate and his god the shepherd dog was a type of the priestcraft the dog's ability to sense and follow unseen persons for miles symbolized the transcendental power by which the philosopher follows the thread of truth through the labyrinth of earthly error. The dog is also the symbol of Mercury. The dog star, Sirius or Sothis, was sacred to the Egyptians because it presaged the annual inundations of the Nile. It's true, the, the heliacal rising of the star Sirius was used to predict the time of the f flooding of the Nile which was otherwise uh, relatively unpredictable. And so the heliacal rising is the, um, basically the rising on the horizon of, the, um, of a certain star or any celestial body uh, at a certain time. And the, um, the heliacal rising of, um, of Sirius was used to determine like I, he said, the flooding of the Nile. But Sirius has been given a great importance by a lot of people. And in fact, I think that in Mormonism, there is a, uh, it is said that, uh, that God dwells or has his throne, at least, around another star called Kolob. And Kolob is... Uh, in, in Hebrew, there's no vowels written often. Uh, they can write vowels as diacritical marks, but oftentimes there's no vowels written at all. And Kolob is Hebrew that's the same as Hebrew of Caleb, which means dog. And so the star, the dog star, uh, seems to relate, I think, to the star Sirius. Uh, one of the shafts in the, in the, great, um, the great Pyramid of Giza actually points also at the uh, at the star Sirius and has something to do with the prediction of the Nile flooding and other things like that uh, the star Sirius was the companion of o o Orion the uh, constellation of Orion um, being a being Sirius is the uh, often the brightest star in the sky and uh, I think that it can be sometimes outshone by Betelgeuse which is variable in its brightness but the uh, Sirius is um, Sirius is, is, is quite bright and is known as the faithful dog of Orion. Um, as a beast of burden, the horse was the symbol of the body of man forced to sustain the weight of his spiritual constitution. Conversely, it also typified the spiritual nature of man forced to maintain the burden of the material personality. Chiron, the centaur, mentor, mentor of Achilles, uh, represents the primitive creation, 
which was the progenitor and instructor of mankind, as described by Bar Barosus. The winged horse and the magic carpet both symbolize the secret doctrine and the spiritualized body of man. Uh, the winged horse being used, the Pegasus, as a, uh, as a symbol by Plato, actually by Socrates within Plato. Uh, Socrates says that the soul is born by a chariot, which is pulled by two Pegasus, uh, or pe Pegasi. And the two winged horses, they... Um, in the average soul, there is one good horse and one evil, or one who is suboptimal, we should say. He's, he's not healthy. We could say one is healthy and one is unhealthy. In the gods, two are healthy, and in the uh, hellish spirits, or the spirits of the underworld, both are unhealthy. And the difference is, is that uh, beings that like humans tend to go the for a time the uh, healthy pegasus will be able to draw us up above the clouds so that we see the light or the world of the true reality that exists outside or above the clouds that cloud true reality from our perception and but eventually the weakness um, of the unhealthy pegasus draws us back down uh, beneath the clouds and that we come back down to the earth and manifest physically the gods by contrast never have to descend into physical bodies and so they or never have to descend to the earth in any case and they um, are able to stay above the clouds and spirits of the underworld are not able to ever see the light of the true reality and thus become quite uh uh, ignorant or their view is quite distorted um, so the wooden horse of Troy uh, secreting an army for the capture of the city uh, represents man's body concealing within it those infinite potentialities which will later come forth and conquer his environment again like Noah's Ark it represents the spiritual nature of man as containing a host of latent potentialities which subsequently become active. The Siege of Troy is a symbolic account of the abduction of the human soul, Helena, by the personality, Paris, and its final redemption through a persevering struggle by the secret doctrine, the Greek arm, army under the command of Agamemnon. Here we have our last picture, so if you have a question, uh, now is a good time to put it in the chat. Uh, and we'll finish in, a, in just a minute. So here we're taking a look at Aeneas and the Harpies from Virgil's Aeneid, uh, which is Dryden's translation. Among the mythological creatures of the mysteries were the Harpies, projections into material substance of beings existing in the invisible world of nature. They were described uh, they were described by the Greeks as being composite uh, with the heads of maidens and the bodies of birds. The wings of the harpies were composed of metal, and their flight was accompanied by a terrible clanging noise. During his wanderings, Aeneas, the Trojan hero, landed on the islands of the harpies, where he and his followers vainly battled with these monsters. One of the harpies perched upon a cliff, and their prophecy to Aeneid that his attack upon them would bring dire calamity to the Trojans. So let's take a look here. That's pretty hard to see. This is Aeneas here, uh, the army behind him, and uh, this is a harpy here you can see with a body of a bird and wings here and a head of a woman, uh, notably breasts. Uh, that's often a part of harpies. Uh, they often are shown with with notable breasts and so often their breasts that are clearly ones that uh, would not have uh, would not provide much sustenance to children so they represent kind of a, a barrenness so I always like to begin and end with songs as a kind of blessing But mandolins get out of tune the longer they sit out.
much better. Have a blessed rest of your day and thank you for listening. If you've made it this far, congratulations. Our next uh, lecture will be on flowers, plants, fruits, and trees. And uh, we will, I'm going to be releasing these more often um, as time goes on because I want to um, get this finished. I want to finish it and it seems like I have time and space here now that I can make them again at a regular pace so I will be making them again soon uh, if you have any suggestions uh, feel free to leave them in the comments or come to our discord and let me know the suggestions in our suggestions channel uh, or any requests or questions or anything uh, we also are going to be doing more of our Radio Free Transarctica Kind of open lines discussions where we'll uh, have group discussions about certain things uh, and if you'd like to join in on those come to our they'll be posted on this channel but also you'll uh, you can see them uh, you can join in on them by coming to uh, the discord that is in the description uh, thank you very much and i hope you have a wonderful rest of your day